Hello everybody. This video talk is on the social work topic of anti-discriminatory practice. I'm preparing this talk for students at Yevla University. I taught in Yevla back in May. Maybe one or two of you were in that session back then. Um, my name is Magnus Fanton. I'm from the University of Fechta, which is in Germany. You can probably hear my British accent. I was born in Britain, but I've lived in Germany for, for 20 years now. Um, and I have a real identity based on both cultures. And in social work, an interest in comparative social work. And our topic today is kind of about comparative social work because we're considering a social work theory from a particular place. And social work theories tend to be linked to particular countries or regions. Good, what's the program for today? Who is this video for? Why is my, my topic interesting? Um, well, as I've already said, it's being prepared for students at Yevla University, and I understand your students specializing in international social work. So I think my topic is interesting to you for two particular reasons. Firstly, as I've mentioned, it's interesting because it's from a particular place. This is a dominant Anglo-Saxon social work theory. Um, it comes from a particular cluster of countries. Um, so for you, it may be a little bit foreign and that makes it interesting in itself. Foreign social work theory is always interesting. A second reason though why it's interesting for you, given your area of specialization, we work today in a global society, don't we? Our societies, our global societies are characterized by diversity. I'm thinking of diversity in terms of people's uh, mother tongues, ethnicity, religions, and so on. And thinking about such a diverse society, we need tools to help us work sensitively in that, to help us be mindful of that diversity. And I think this social work theory helps us do just that. Good. The programme for this video, um, in a minute I'll be kicking it off with some context. First of all, I want to put the theory in a kind of historical context in terms of its role in the theory development uh, of UK and US social work. Good. Then I want to think about it in terms of the practice context. What kind of social work does the UK have and what kind of social policy and welfare state is that social work embedded in? That is relevant here. Then I'll clarify some terminology, which is important, uh, an important little detail. And then I'll recommend a couple of authors, authors whose books uh, I think you might want to read. Then I'm going to jump into the work of one of those authors, picking a definition from one of those books. It's by an author called Thompson. I'm going to go into his definition of this anti-discriminatory practice in detail. Then I'm going to be briefly discussing an interesting model which he proposes. It's a model which is really well known in the UK. So that's the programme. At the end there will be literature and I'll also say a few words about myself on the last slide. Good, let's jump into the contexts. Let's go back in history, let's go back a, a few decades, let's go back to the post-war period, thinking of the UK, thinking of the US. What was social work like back then? What kind of models or theories did we use? Well, one of our classic methods was individual work, work of individual families, and the, the view of the client at that time was quite different to today. In particular, we zoomed in on the things that needed to be changed in our clients. So we had a kind of individual pathology view of the client influenced by discourses from medicine, uh, legal discourses, that really shaped early 20th century social work. So the client's difficulties were seen as being due to their per person, in particular using a funny phrase of a time, due to their maladjustment to their social environment. There was this idea that the, the client was in a social environment and their difficulties were because they were not adjusted properly to that environment. The client was then helped by the social worker using a psychological or psychodynamic casework approach, meaning we were using back then quite new ideas from psychology. Psychodynamic refers to psychoanalysis. So if you look at a text like Hollis's text from 1964, we've got lots of Freudian jargon. So the social worker is helping the client really working with the client, understanding the client using a psychoanalytical framework. Now we have variants of that, other forms of casework, problem solving and so on. But, but the essence of this model was that it was one-to-one -one work trying to change a client. 
And people would say from today's perspective, it was very paternalistic and it was actually quite disempowering. That's the background. When did things change? Things changed, I think, in the UK and the US uh, in the 60s. And um, uh, a very small book, which played a very large role in this change, is uh, this one here. Peter Leonard's text, Sociology and Social Work. Um, instead of that medical, psychological background, we were encouraged to think about our clients' lives sociologically. So it encouraged us to look more at the structural causes of our clients' difficulties and how they were battling disadvantage and difficult life situations. And this, this text uses language which would have been quite new at that time. So it talks about social structures, social change, social class. There's um, a lovely section at the end of the book where the author recommends further reading. Um, and it's books with really, really interesting titles. Um, for example, one of the books has the title of Class, Status and Power, or we're encouraged to consult the mental health of the poor. So a seed was planted and this was a good time for returning to ideas from sociology because, of course, the late 1960s, that was a time of social change. You had social movements which became very, very vibrant. Feminism, civil rights, disability rights, but we can add to that list. So a whole bunch of vibrant social movements. And by the 1970s, where we had a well-developed radical social work in the UK. Um, now, this was a, a movement which, which, which really had energy. Um, it didn't manage the transition to the 1980s. Um, and that was a very, very difficult political climate for UK social workers. It's also worth noting uh, this particular movement never really properly migrated to other countries. We didn't really have it in Germany. And I think even in America, we didn't, we didn't really have it as they did in the UK. But I think, again, there was a kind of a seed there. Um, those ideas have developed, and I'm going to be returning to those ideas actually right at the end of this talk. So that's the historical background to this theory. It arises out of that 1960s movement. Good. The other important context, thinking comparatively here, what on earth is Anglo-Saxon social work like? And what kind of welfare state is it embedded in? Well, actually, that's a topic for another talk. But just to sketch an answer here, because it is relevant, social work in countries such as the UK tends to have fewer financial resources. And it tends to have a weaker political mandate than in other parts of Europe. Now, I'm saying this from my German perspective, but I think it's also valid for you from your Swedish perspective. You might in turn say, hey, Magnus, hang on, the Swedish welfare state is also changing, changing rapidly. We don't have those generous family services uh, that we did in the past. I don't know, maybe that is the case, but nonetheless, you really can uh, note a very, very clear difference. Social work in the UK was always quite different from social work on the continent. Social work in the UK, Esping Anderson describes the UK as having a liberal welfare state. That's how Esping Anderson described the welfare state form. Let's give concrete social work examples here. Um, thinking of my German context, in Germany, like in many European states, we have quite comprehensive low threshold family support services. So if there's issues of child raising, we can have preventative help. And that's much less common in liberal welfare states like the UK, like America. And this difference, it really impacts on UK social work theory. So Anglophone social work is by its social policy context, it's more residual, it's kind of there at the edges, it's not mainstream in the middle of society. It's remedial, it fixes things which are problematic or, or broken in some sense. It's reactive. It's not preventative, it's not proactive, you know, it's not in general no threshold. So hold on to that because that context shapes this theory which I'm going to be talking about now. Good, in a minute we're going to jump into a definition, but uh, I want to say a few words about the terminology. You can look up anti-discriminatory practice in your favourite social work dictionary. Um, this one here by Harris and White is my favourite social work dictionary. And if you look it up, you'll find something a little bit annoying. We don't actually have one concept, we actually have two. We have the idea of anti-discriminatory practice, but below we also have anti-oppressive practice. So we seem to have two concepts, not one concept, anti-discriminatory practice 
and anti-oppressive practice. And dictionaries like this separate them. So are these the same or are they different? Is fighting discrimination the same as fighting oppression? One, the idea of discrimination, that has legal nuances of meaning. So you could understand that a little bit narrowly. The other word, oppression, seems to be broader, more general. It goes further than the first. And for this reason, some authors prefer to separate the terms. So they would say we really have two quite separate concepts here. Other authors, though, protest against separating them and use the two terms more or less as being synonyms. Why? What's their argument? Well, if you fight oppression and if you fight discrimination, you'll notice they both tend to happen often in the private sphere. Now, there may be a legal way in which some action of some person is uh, legally to be addressed, but social workers are often more useful than lawyers anyway. You know, because we're in the life world of our clients, we have access to these spaces, and we have these very gentle methods of, of changing, helping people to change their lives. So because of that, because of the private sphere, you know, the question whether or not something actually is legal or not, often that, that's not really important anyway. As long as it's identified as being oppression, we, we need to be thinking about how it can be addressed. So I'll follow the line of those authors saying, yeah, let's not focus on the differences. Let's address these two areas together. Good, let's move on. I've promised you some reading tips. Um, I'm based in Germany and it's quite hard to get your hands onto English language social work books. They are in some university libraries. You often have to get them sent to you by, by the, the distance lending facility or even buy them from overseas. So I'm mindful of the fact that it's worth thinking about what you, you want to read um, and sometimes you have to work to get your hands on the books. Let me, let me recommend two particular authors. I like this topic because two of the authors who've written on this topic really are two of my, my favourite authors. And a nice starting place might be this book here by Lina Dominelli, um, Anti-Oppressive Social Work, Theory and Practice. A really interesting author. Uh, that was published in 2002 and in the same year she published this text, also highly recommended, and she wrote a further book um, on anti-racist social work. Really interesting author, um, herself very international, is completely off topic, but I've also enjoyed reading her green social work read recently. Um, yeah, thoroughly recommended literature. But today I'm going to be focusing on another author. I'm going to be dipping into this a lot in the course of the next half hour. This is Neil Thompson's Anti-Discriminatory Practice. And my edition here is a bit older. It's from 2006, I think. Um, this is now in its sixth edition. So very much a well-regarded text. Thompson himself wrote a kind of successor to this. Interesting if you want to delve into a topic in much more detail. I'd like to take this opportunity to recommend Thompson's work. Um, he's an author who writes with a great clarity. So his, his English has a simplicity in the sentence structure. I find it very readable and that's an important criteria for you, presuming that you are non-native speakers. So there you are, I'll be dipping a lot into Neil Thompson's ideas today. In fact, my presentation is based on a definition that he offers us. So um, I'm going to throw up a definition. Please note I've modified his definition slightly. Um, you'll see brackets where I've changed his words. The words in the square brackets have been changed. I've changed a couple simply to pick a simpler phrase so that you understand the sentence more quickly. And in one case, I've made an alteration because he explicitly lists forms of discrimination. I thought it'd be more interesting to get you to to think of those forms yourself. So here's the definition that he offers. Let's read it together, but I invite you afterwards to pause the video and to reread it a few times on your own, maybe even looking up words which we're not quite sure about. Here you are, what is it? Anti-discriminatory practice. An approach to practice which seeks to reduce, undermine, or eliminate discrimination and oppression, specifically in terms of challenging forms of discrimination and oppression encountered in practice. Social workers occupy positions of power and influence, and so there's considerable capacity for discrimination and oppression, whether this be intentional or unintentional. Anti-discriminatory practice is an attempt to eradicate discrimination and oppression from our own practice and challenge them in the practice of others and in the institutional structures in which we operate. In this respect, it's a form of emancipatory practice. 
Again, reread that a few times. We're going to spend lots of time now thinking about this sentence by sentence. So let's start at the beginning. Let's go back to his first, first definition lines there. Anti-discriminatory practice, an approach to practice which seeks to reduce, undermine or eliminate discrimination and oppression specifically in terms of challenging forms of discrimination and oppression encountered in practice. Excuse me. So, as I mentioned, Thompson actually lists some forms explicitly. I've removed it here, but he lists four forms of discrimination and oppression word for word. Try to think of as many grounds, as many reasons for discrimination and oppression as possible. Now, many of Thompson's four, I think all of Thompson's four, are isms. Okay, so think of some isms. Some of the reasons why some people discriminate, some people oppress, is because of isms. Try and make a list. Now, you should come up with many more than Thompson's original four. There's many reasons why some people in our society oppress other people in society. They've got many grounds, many reasons for doing this. It goes without saying this is a deeply unpleasant list to make. You know, you're, you're thinking about the most horrible ways in which we treat other people badly, but it's a worthwhile exercise to collect the possible grounds because you'll be mindful of just how many there are. So pause now and unpause now. What did you come up with? Well, Thompson's original four are sexism, racism, ageism and disabilism but those are obviously the, the major ways in which we might discriminate or oppress others but it's worth noting um, in producing your list you may have many many more points and i've got something like an extra 10. have a have a listen to this this is my list i thought of uh, discrimination on account of religion i thought of it on account of language now it may be on account of somebody being a non-native speaker so maybe somebody has a foreign accent but i also thought native speakers have accents or they speak regional dialects and that could be a source for, for being discriminated against then i have sexuality so you can talk about heterosexism here but i also thought about gender identity for example if somebody is non-binary that may lead to them being treated differently we can discriminate people on account of their political views or on account of their nationality. Or, for example, because they deviate from our ideas of health norms or mental health norms. Sometimes we discriminate against people because of what their body is like in terms of weight or physique, for example. I've got other points. I've got social class. So you can discriminate against somebody because they're working class in your eyes. I've got family status. People may be discriminated against because they're single or an unmarried parent, for example. But we could add other things, for example, appearance, clothing, tattoos, or even lifestyle choices. The more you think about it, the more possible reasons there are why some people oppress others. So as I said, it's a gloomy list. It's not a nice thing to do to, to, to think of all the possible ways in which people may be mistreated, but it's worth being aware of just how much oppression and discrimination may be around you. Good. And again, as a society, we're being much more mindful of this today. Um, I was socialised with 1970s and 1980s BBC TV. And if you watch a comedy from the 1980s, don't be surprised if you get jokes which are sexist or homophobic or even racist. You know, TV was quite horrible back in the 1970s. So it was very much normalised in that culture. Now we're much more sensitive to it. Being sensitive to it is a skill which we have to develop. Good. Let's move on. Thompson's uh, definition continues interestingly. He notes social workers occupy positions of power, power and influence. And so there's considerable capacity for discrimination and for, for oppression. Whether this be intentional or unintentional. So my next task for you, press pause and think of a time when you intentionally or unintentionally discriminated against a client. Now, I'm guessing you're feeling a little bit angry right now. You might be saying to me, Magnus, hang on, I'm, I'm the social worker. I protect my clients against oppression, oppression from others. I protect them against discrimination. I'm not the discriminating person. 
I think Thompson's formulation here is uh, exact and it is a little bit provocative for good reason. I think the view that we, the social workers, are never part of the problem, I think that view is naive. Sometimes we social workers are part of the problem. Oppression and discrimination is not just something that other people do. Maybe we're doing it ourselves, intentionally or unintentionally. So question yourself. This is the spirit of it, self-reflection. Maybe you are quite a non-judgmental, quite an accepting, quite a tolerant person. But that tolerance, that non-judgmentalness, that's, that's a characteristic which you have to nurture. You know, that's the art of life, isn't it? To nurture that within yourself. Most of us have some kind of blind spots. We have some kind of topics which we're uncomfortable thinking about uncomfortable reflecting on. So yes, think of your prejudices, but also think of the things that you, you find difficult. You know, what are your preferences and what things aren't you so comfortable with? Fantasy. Pretend I'm your client and I tell you things about my life. You know, what if I say, oh, by the way, I'm a strict vegan, or I use substances, or maybe I tell you I'm a single parent, or maybe I tell you that I have same-sex partners, or maybe I tell you that I'm an evangelical Christian. Or maybe I tell you that I, I put my kids in full-time daycare when they were three months old. Or maybe I tell you that I can't read very well. Or maybe I tell you that I vote for a different party to you in general elections. Again, I'm just throwing out a, a few possible examples here. The point is, some of those things you might not have thought about before, some of your reactions to some of those things might have been problematic. So the invitation to think about when you oppressed, you know, I make this point with the utmost of seriousness. And when I was doing this reflection exercise myself, I looked into the past, I thought of times when I made mistakes. Now in social work from time to time, you say something and what you say is wrong. And maybe you have to apologize. So I apologized to a client once or twice. And that's a natural part of, of your working life. You know, if you're an honest, self-reflective, practitioner. So think about what you said that was wrong and what was behind it. Be self-critical, that really is in the spirit of this theory. Try to seek your own blind spots. Thompson's definition continues, anti-discriminatory practice is an attempt to eradicate discrimination and oppression from our own practice and challenge them in the practice of others. My questions for you here, is either of these tasks easy? You know, so it's an easy thing to do. And what tools and techniques can we use to help us in this eradication of oppression? Maybe, excuse me. Sorry for the interruption, guys. Where were we? Is either of these tasks easy? I guess that first question is a rhetorical question. Clearly it isn't. This, this self-reflection, this self-criticism is a very hard thing to do, and criticizing others. That's obviously like walking on eggshells. But let's think about how we do it in practice. What tools and techniques do we have to help us eradicating this oppression in our social work practice? Scratch your heads for a few moments. We do have ways of dealing with this. Maybe it's nice to start with your status. Uh, many of you guys are social work students, okay? So what's it like when you're studying social work? You do practice placements, and there you have a chance to reflect on your practice. Again, and to say, okay, I made a mistake there, I have to learn from that. And if you think about it, social work also has opportunities for us to keep that spirit of self-criticism and self-reflection through our working life. I would highlight supervision as being possibly the most valuable tool that we have here. And that really is part of your typical social work week or fortnight or month, isn't it? So one-to-one -one supervision, group or team supervision. And of course, we also have special training days. We have a chance for continuous professional development. Maybe you keep reflective portfolios. Think about all of these possibilities. It's a place for us to nurture this awareness of our own oppression of others. Good, let's continue with Thompson's definition, the next part. 
So as well as doing it with ourselves and our colleagues and challenge discrimination and the oppression in the institutional structures in which we operate. In other words, Thompson is talking about challenging institutional racism, institutional disabilism, institutional ageism, institutional sexism. What do these words mean? What is institutional discrimination? So uh, this is something that we've become more aware of in recent decades, institutional discrimination. I guess the point here is that institutional discrimination is when the structures and the behavioural patterns within an institution creates discrimination. It's not the individuals, because the individuals might come and go. You know, some of those discriminating individuals will leave. But the same discrimination will continue to occur within this institution. Brits had uh, painful examples of this in recent decades. Um, something like two decades ago, we became aware that our police force was being institutionally racist. So it wasn't serving uh, members of particular ethnic minority groups as well as it was other citizens in society. So a, a painful moment and there was lots of reflection there. I think um, we can also say that you'd have another example in the prison system. Uh, the prison system um, is, is, is a very difficult place to be if you have mental health difficulties. So we could say that there's some form of, yeah, disabilism in the prison system. And the more you think about it, the more you'll find examples in other institutions. Good, so we're looking at the way in which this discrimination is not just a one-to-one -one thing happening between two individuals, but rather it may happen within organisations, within the culture of different institutions. And of course, that idea leads us to the idea that maybe our social work agency is itself oppressing others or discriminating against some of our clients. Again, this, this theory is filled with these painful thoughts. I want to move on now. I want to talk about this model, which I've mentioned briefly. Thompson developed a PCS model for understanding the levels at which oppression occurs. And once again, I'm delving into the same book uh, that I was showing you earlier on. This is going back to Thompson's book, the same book, which I, I used the definition from um, a moment ago. So he suggests that oppression and discrimination can be identified as occurring at three different levels. And he, he illustrates these levels uh, with three spheres or circles, one inside the other. He describes it as being the P, the C and the S levels. So my next question for you is, what could these letters stand for? Because the letters stand for words and the words describe what's going on at each one of these distinct levels. So scratch your heads, maybe it's nice if I give you a clue. Um, one word which might fit for P would be person or personal. Thompson's clever though, for each one of these letters he comes up with four or even five different words. So have a head scratch and press pause. Let me give you the words that Thompson uh, reveals to us in his text. The P level, I've already said, person or personal, you know, because it's happening between individuals, between persons. What's motivating it, my prejudices, and in part my psychology, there's psychological explanations of why people oppress others. The final word here, practice, Thomas is drawing our attention to the fact that we're practitioners, you know, so it's about me working with my clients, the people that I'm responsible for. So four words there, personal, psychological, prejudice and practice. And that's the inner, the most central of these three rings, the inner ring, the inner level. That in turn is embedded in the second level, and that was the C level, if you recall. What C words did you come up with? Uh, Thompson has some interesting C words. Excuse me, let me play with my technology slightly. He starts with the idea of culture. So this middle level is the level of culture. Where does culture come from? Lots of people together. What binds people together? Commonalities, for example. Thompson adds some other interesting words here. Consensus, you know, we have, we have similar beliefs. We agree on things together, collectively. Um, and the next word maybe is a bit more problematic. Think of the idea of conformity. Earlier on, when I talked about our global societies, I was stressing the diversity that we have in our societies today. But it, in a sense, conformity is the opposite of diversity, isn't it? It's trying to be the same as some other people. The last word looks at first glance like it doesn't fit. Comic, you know, what's, what's humour got to do with this? Well, the way in which people create a we feeling. 
We don't just do it because of their commonalities and by finding consensus on topics. We, we, we do it using art and culture in a much more general sense. And humor is one way in which we create a, a weeness. But it's a problematic way because this humor is often at the cost of others and it often excludes and oppresses against others. So that's the C level. Now the P is embedded in the C level and the C level is in turn embedded in the S level. What words do we have there? We have the idea of structure. This is looking at discrimination as happening at the structural level. Structures within our society. And these structures create social divisions. Looking at this from an institutional perspective, think of the laws we have, think of the social laws, the social policy that we have. Each country's social policy is a little bit different from other countries, and each country's social policy gives advantages to some citizens and disadvantages to others. So our social policy is also a source of oppression and discrimination. So it's an interesting model. We're looking at um, this oppression, uh, this discrimination occurring on different levels. Again, going back to the beginning, Thompson's interested in recognizing and understanding oppression. You know, where can we locate it? How does it operate? Three circles representing levels at which oppression may have its origins. The levels are deeply interrelated. Each one is embedded within the other. The personal embedded in the cultural, the cultural in the structural. So we've got this particular arrangement. How is it then? Can, can we change any of this? You know, if I see oppression at this level, if I see it here, what can I do about it? Is, is this unchangeable? So the interactions behind this embedding, they're strong, but they're not unchangeable. Just because I'm in an oppressive culture doesn't mean that I have to be oppressive at the personal level. We have some potential to break this connection. So you could say, kind of shaking up these interactions, shaking up these transfers from one level to, to the other, maybe breaking the transfer of oppression from one sphere to the next. Maybe that's a social worker's key task, maybe. Yeah, I've been talking about this theory now for the last half hour. You might be, be begging me for a concrete example. Give me an example from practice. How can this theory be useful to social workers in their everyday practice? How can we apply it? For example, how could anti-discriminatory practice be implemented during a routine social work client meeting? So again, maybe press pause, scratch your heads for a few moments. Now, how could this work in practice? Now, I would immediately respond here by saying each person does it differently. This theory is not meant to be prescriptive. You know, we each have flexibility into how we use this particular idea. How, how do I take this idea away? How, how would I use it in my practice? Um, just thinking about or talking with that client, um, maybe you have a chance to, to gently think about things in the client's life from that perspective of them being oppressive or discriminatory. So that's one possibility, that, that, that gentle collective reflection. Sometimes maybe the social worker wants to, to question something that the client says, challenge something that the client is assuming. So shaking up those assumptions that are out there. Sometimes language has a role here. I find it fascinating if you look at the language that we're all using. My students sometimes use words and I question my students' words, you know, normal. Why did you say normal there? You know, why is that normal or not normal? What is normal to you? Now, sometimes you do find real discrimination that maybe uh, we can address using some kind of legal uh, measure. Sometimes that is possible, often it isn't, sometimes it is. So there may be some kind of advocacy role for you to formally represent the client's rights. And again, that could happen in, in the course of the one-to-one -one case management. Or you could even look at it in, in, the, in the wider context of, say, the client's community. And then the work could even spill over into campaigning or, or, or lobbying for the client and the client's interests. And the client's rights. So you've got a whole bunch of different ways, different levels at which you could take these ideas. But I guess the essence uh, to summarize would be this idea of, of creating more freedoms, creating freedom for your client to act, and slowly, bit by bit, 
changing cultures, you know, little piece by little piece. So we're part of this, this bigger societal change, which is happening all the time. You know, we play a microscopically small role in that, but even that microscopically small role can be important, can be contributing to that wider change. So we've got this theory, are there criticisms of it? Are there difficulties doing it in practice? Of course there are, and I'm guessing you might have been seeing criticisms of this theory whilst I've been talking. What did you come up with? What can we say? Well, firstly, this is a fairly mature theory. Um, the books I was pointing to earlier date from, say, the, the 1990s, so this is really quite a mature theory that's been used for a while now. Um, like all theories which become important, which become dominant, um, sometimes the, the term anti-discriminatory practice or the term anti-oppressive practice is misused. Sometimes people say they're doing something which they're clearly not, so the ideas have been to some extent watered down devalued maybe, maybe that's inevitable. Maybe a more serious objection is to the difficulties actually applying this theory in practice. And in the UK setting, um, I think one particular issue is the mandate that social workers have. Social workers are quite passionate about this anti-oppressive practice, it's, it's close to our hearts, but it may not correspond to what the public or the politicians want us to be doing. So we celebrate our role in, in, in empowering our clients' emancipation, but actually the public wish is that we control our clients. You know, for the public or for the politicians, we're not a social change agent, we're actually a social control agent. And that's the contradiction. So social workers may find themselves doing this anti-oppressive practice, but not because they're being asked to, doing it because of their own professional ethics, and maybe even doing it kind of by stealth, unofficially. Good. And it goes without saying, sometimes social workers have the frustration of not having the resources to enable their clients to fight oppression uh, and discrimination. So a lack of resources is another practical problem, applying this theory to your practice. I want to go back to the definition, the last sentence in the definition for my last words here. Uh, the last sentence of that definition was, anti-discriminatory practice, it's a form of emancipatory practice. And I really, really like this idea. I'd like to take this last opportunity to draw your attention to yet more books. Um, I invite you to view this, this theory, uh, anti-discriminatory practice, alongside its humanist, its radical, and its critical forebears, offshoots and cousins. And there's a whole Aladdin's cave of literature out there. Um, check out all of these concepts, many of which are associated with one particular author, that uh, they really will enrich in your work. And that brings me to the uh, literature for this talk. Here's all the books that I've been referring to uh, in the course of the last 40 minutes or so. Oh, and I promise to say a few words about myself. Uh, here's what I've published. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this talk. I hope you find it interesting. Thanks for watching.